now it's time to hear from you, Professor McKenna. Please go ahead. Really, what I began was was uh, agreeing with Wolfgang about his um, congratulations to the work that you and your wife have done, especially in the opening ceremonies and the piano recital yesterday afternoon. I, I fully enjoyed this. Um, the title of my presentation today is based on a Russian proverb that I've taken from Alexander Solzhenitsyn's novel, uh, which is titled in Russian, Vkrugi Pierum, and in English translation, in the first circle. Uh, we in the West in general, especially in the United States, have long heard the translation of this uh, novel into English as the first circle. Very importantly, um, Solzhenitsyn intended this to be in the first circle, clearly a uh, ref reference to Dante's uh, Divine Comedy. Um, the proverb that I'm talking about um, in Russian goes, Lukshi chleb zvadoyu, chem pirok bidoyu. In English translation, better bread and water than cake and trouble. A proverb key for unlocking the meaning of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's novel in the first circle. Now I should begin, by the way, uh, to alert the viewing audience today, this evening, that I am myself am not a former Zek, or in Russian prisoner, from Solzhenitsyn's novel. The obnoxious gap in the upper front teeth of my mouth have to do with an upcoming dental procedure and not with any uh, scuffle, prison scuffle in a Russian gulag camp. A year from now at the 15th International Proverb Conference in 2021, I propose to give a presentation on Nobel Prize winning writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn's use of Russian proverbs in his fictional works. That Solzhenitsyn was a strong believer in and practitioner of the use of proverbs in his Russian writing is widely known. Virtually all of his fictional aura and just about all of his publicistic works reflect the timeless wisdom of Russian proverbs and proverbial expressions. It might be said, in fact, that no Russian writer in the 20th century interspersed a greater number of proverbs into his fiction than did Alexander Isayevich. In my opinion, one would have to look back to the fables of Krylov, the fiction of Pushkin, Gogol, Liskov, or Tolstoy in the 19th century to find a comparable purveyor of Russian popular speech, especially in the form of proverbs and proverbial expressions. Understandably, growing up in the dry artificial language of Soviet socialist realism, Solzhenitsyn sought a return to the inner brilliance um, and um, insight of Russian proverbs. Indicative of his strong regard for the incor incorporation of Russian proverbs in his fiction, following up on the popular and critical success of his first prison novel, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which appeared in 1962, Solzhenitsyn famously participated in a scholarly discussion about stylistics in the modern Russian language in his proverb titled article, which in English translation goes, it is not customary to whiten cabbage soup with tar, end of quote. Published in 1965 in the leading Russian literary journal 
Literaturnaya Gazeta, issue number 31. In this controversial article, Solzhenitsyn declared, and I quote, it is not too late to improve the character of our written language in order to bring back to it a folkish, idiomatic lightness and freedom, end of quote. As Russian scholar Leonid Rzhevsky has observed in his call for greater attention to popular speech in the 20th century Russian literature, Solzhenitsyn had in mind much more than the vocabulary of the folk. And to quote from Rzhevsky, it includes the entire structure of oral expression. From popular speech, Solzhenitsyn borrows its spontaneity, its emotional overtones, its figurative expression, end of quote. So one might ask, what was the initial source and influence on Solzhenitsyn in developing this passion for Russian popular speech in his novels and short stories in the form of Russian proverbs and proverbial expressions? We know, for example, that Solzhenitsyn was first introduced to Russian proverbs early on in his youth by his aunt Irina, and that Vladimir Dahl's famous compendium of Russian proverbs, titled Vaslovitsi Ruskova Naroda, published in 1859, was one of three books that Solzhenitsyn took with him into exile in the Gulag prison camps in 1946. Further evidence that um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn felt strongly about Russian proverbs is attested to near the end of his novel, Vkrugi Pirvon, the Russian original title of In the First Circle, where one of the protagonists observes, and I quote from him, there were no pretenses and no lofty pretensions in the common people's proverbial sayings. The folk were even more frank about themselves in their huge stock of proverbs than Tolstoy or Dostoevsky in their confessions." End of quote. In summarizing my Solzhenitsyn presentation for next year's conference, I want to focus this evening on one particular novel of Solzhenitsyn's writing that not only confirms the author's views on popular folk speech, but more importantly, reflects his genius for employing Russian proverbs in his fictional writing, not only to enrich the folk tone of the novel, but to invest it with an underlying depth of meaning and traditional folk wisdom and understanding. That novel, as you can probably guess, is his Vkrugi Pirvum in the first circle, initially published in a self-censored form of only 87 chapters in 1968, and following the collapse of the Soviet Union, revised and republished in 2006 in an annotated, lengthened, and uncensored version of 96 chapters. Now, any of us here this evening who has read this thematically engaging novel could point to one of our own favorite folk wisdoms from Solzhenitsyn's masterful and complex work. Some might select the peasant Spiridon's proverbial antidote to Gleb Nierzhin's pressing question toward the end of the novel about the meaning of life. And I quote, whether anybody on earth can possibly make out who is right and who is wrong, end of quote. To which the nearly blind prison yardman Spiridon quickly and easily responds with an old Russian folk proverb, and I quote, Volkadav prav, aludayed nyut. In English translation, killing wolves is right, eating people is wrong. 
Others of us might point to another of the wise old Spiridon's proverbial sayings about how one's plans do not always meet with success. And I quote, Tak vot i buvoyet, siem rosh avirastayet libeda. In English translation, well, it's like that sometimes. We plant rye, and what comes up is goosegrass. End of quote. These and countless other proverbs in this brilliant novel might vie for greatest popularity and insight into the story's theme among Solzhenitsyn's readers. Two years ago, for example, at uh, conferences at the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg and Moscow, which I attended with Wolfgang, I made a case for a certain proverb from Solzhenitsyn's novel that at that time, I felt best encapsulated the underlying message of this work. The age old wisdom that, and I quote, Mimuria topit, aluja. It's not the sea that drowns us, but the puddle. That Solzhenitsyn repeats this intriguing proverb at least four times in the novel certainly calls attention to its importance to the story's plot and insightful underlying theme. What I would like to suggest for our consideration today, however, is yet another proverb from Solzhenitsyn's novel that in my opinion, even better succeeds in capturing and reinforcing the fundamental underlying message of this novel. The proverb, better bread with water than cake with trouble. In the Russian version, As I will argue in my brief presentation this evening and expand upon at next year's conference, this particular Russian folk expression, while twice tellingly uttered in the final chapter of the novel by Ilya Herobrov, one of the story's litany of polyphonic protagonists, applies equally well to an additional three other prison protagonists in this rich and vast novel of political and ethical conscience. Owing to limited time constraints this evening, I will only address the application of this folk wisdom to the radio engineer Ilya Kherobrov, extending my full analysis of this proverb to an additional three characters at next year's conference in 2021. Like many of the other characters in this novel, Ilya Kherobrov lives and works as an engineer and radio expert at the Marfino Sharashka, a slang expression for a scientific labor camp in a suburb outside of Moscow. Also, like many of the camp Zex, a Russian term for prisoners, um, he had been incarcerated for a minor offense earlier for defacing an electoral ballot with an obscenity and had previously worked in a full-fledged gulag forced labor camp before coming to the Marfino Institute. In the final and richly developed chapter of the novel, the radio engineer Herobrov is one of the 20 prisoners about to be transferred from the relative comfort of the Marfino Sharashka to the far harsher frozen tundra of Siberia. Prior to boarding the transfer truck, insidiously labeled with a quadrate lingual sign, meat, Gleb Nerzhin, the main protagonist of Solzhenitsyn's narrative, attempts to bolster the spirits of his gloomy, forlorn companions by challenging one of the junior lieutenants that Gleb and his fellow Zex will not agree to board the transit truck until they have been properly provided the lunch meal being administered to the 241 prisoners 
remaining behind in the Sharashka. Reflect, reflecting on the bold fearlessness of the condemned prisoners, the novel's narrator insightly observes, and I quote, this farewell meal with meat was not only their last chance to eat their fill before the months and years of thin gruel ahead. It was an assertion of their human dignity, end of quote. When one of the now sated Zex dolefully inquires, and I quote, will we live to eat the like of it again? End of quote. Herobrov indignantly responds with a proverbial retort. No, friends, bread and water is better than tart and trouble. End of quote. Shortly thereafter, ruminating about his thoughts on leaving the Marfino Sharashka, Harabrov announces to his fellow prisoners. And once again, I quote, I'm not a bit sorry I've left this place. If you fart in the bathroom, the Godfather hears about it right away. We've had no Sundays for two years, the bastards, and a 12 hour working day they banned letters from home. Damn and blast them. Just work, work, and work. It's hell on earth. End of quote. Recognizing his prison comrades' personal pain and understandable indignation, the story's main protagonist, Gleb Nirzhin, nonetheless disagrees with Herobrov. And I quote once again, no, Ilya Terentich, that isn't hell. That is not hell. Hell is where we're going. We're going back to hell. The special prison is the highest, the best, the first circle of hell. It's practically paradise. Shortly thereafter, when another of the gulag-bound prisoners attempts to boost the spirits of his condemned fellow travelers by predicting that Shahrashka Zex prisoners will be the first to be killed off by authorities in time of war, Karabrov repeats his proverbial advice to his companions. And I quote, well, that's what I keep telling you. Bread and water is better than cake and wool, end of quote. So what are we to make of the meaning and application of this Russian proverb in the context of this novel? Just how does it figure so appropriately in communicating the main message of Solzhenitsyn's narrative? While not the only proverb in the Russian author's story to communicate a fundamental underlying message to the novel, I maintain that it eminently succeeds in capturing and communicating the essence of the authorial meaning and ethical message in this gripping narrative of individual choice and personal conscience. First of all, the proverb, the proverb calls into question the seemingly contradictory implication that certain starvation and the dire prospects of the frozen tundra of Siberia pose a graver existential challenge to the Zex, to the prisoners, than the monotony of three square meals a day and the remote possibility of gaining eventual freedom um, from the prison Sharashka as well as remission of their prison sentences and the likelihood of being awarded luxurious apartments and accommodations in the center of Moscow. In the interest of little remaining time this evening, let me, let me conclude my presentation by saying that next year, I will expand my analysis of this Russian proverb by examining its application uh, by an additional three characters from Solzhenitsyn's novel. The optical physicist 
Ilya Gerasimovich, the radio engineer, Dmitry Sologin, and the novel's main protagonist, Glib Nirzhin. With this, I will close for this evening and certainly welcome any questions that the audience may have. Thank you very much, Professor Kevin. And uh, I begin to say that really it's a great hope that uh, you can present full, complete communication next year and Tavir. It will be a pleasure to have you here. Uh, so I think that we have here one question. How do you think the current pandemic will affect the proverbial expression regarding social speaking and publicity? Maybe you can answer, maybe neither. It depends on you. I don't know that I can entirely comfortably answer but I will certainly attempt to respond. Thank you. Um, Russians, like all peoples around the world, in my opinion, certainly understand the dire consequences of the effects on their families, their societies, their cities of this pandemic. In terms of a proverbial understanding of a proverbial response to this pandemic, I don't know whether the uh, person raising this question has in mind this particular proverb. Um, quite frankly, I would guess that he or she, the person raising the question, understands that Russians in general, I think, right up there with the greatest peoples of the world, use and refer to proverbs, their own Russian proverbs for certain, but proverbs in general, as a response to understanding all of the questions and mysteries and sufferings of life. And that would be my response to his or to her question. It was uh, from uh, Maria Isabel Ribaldi the first speaker tonight, yes. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Um, sorry, we, um, it is the same question actually, but we were wondering if Meter can also um, reply to it, if there's time for that. Sobre lo humano, sobre todo lo humano, el proverbio y lo humano. Especially about the, the human side of it. Can you repeat the question one more time? Yes, I can read it if you want. Um, it is, how do you think the current pandemic will affect the proverbial expressions regarding social speaking and publicity? Well, I, I thank you. I, I think my esteemed colleague and perfect friend Kevin McKenna has already done what I basically would say. I think uh, what many people don't realize is, uh, you know, I sometimes get the question, Wolfgang, how can you as a person with average intelligence spend a lifetime looking at proverbs? And, and my answer always is that, that proverbs represent the, as I said earlier, the complexities of our life. And even with the pandemic situation, there are proverbs that will help us to cope with this menace. Um, one that comes to mind immediately is hope springs eternal. It is a perfectly uh, um, legitimate proverb to employ here and I would say to the American governmental leadership right now, uh, that would have been a wonderful proverb to employ. Uh, but also the, what is so amazing at times, I think, what I've noticed with the pandemic, especially many times, and I'm teaching right now proverbs in, in a, to a German class with 28 students. Just the other day, I said to them, isn't it surprising that all the news I hear about the pandemic, 
there's, there would be such wonderful opportunities to maybe plug in an uplifting proverb, you know. Uh, uh, not, in, in other words, um, a positive uh, metaphor that would help all of us to cope with this terrible issue, you know. But, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, as Kevin has shown, here you have a Nobel Prize winning Russian author who delights in using proverbs, but then you have other people who feel they're absolutely stupid to be used. So that's the ambivalence, I think, I think of proverbs. But uh, as far as new pandemic proverbs are concerned, well, I think, I think this is the time to pay attention, uh, which gets me to this whole idea of modern proverbs. We as proverb scholars, it's our responsibility to find proverbs that reflect our age. We, 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 we must overcome the idea that proverbs are old or that, that proverbs uh, uh, can be looked at in isolation. Yes, there will be new proverbs that somehow deal with this disease, you know. And, and Maria, I, I loved your talk, you know, the, the psychology of proverbs, the psycholinguistic part, you know, the, the, the proverbs represent life. You know, there's, there's no doubt about it. And Kevin said it nicely. I mean, there is, there is, uh, um, and, and I just want to stress, they, they, they can be extremely helpful, but they can also harm you know, uh, but I would say um, proverbs can also help in, in psychology, for example, in using proverbs for, for uh, therapy, for, for drug addiction. Proverbs are used as a positive uh, uh, push, uh, very much so, and they serve a great purpose there. Mm -hmm. Maria, I might add Thank to- Thank you very much. I might add to my original um, response to your question. Um, while Solzhenitsyn, of course, is, is a man of letters, a man of literature, um, Putin, Vladimir Putin, definitely is not. Um, and what we see in Russia, and I haven't been to Russia uh, in the last two years, but the typical response, in my opinion, to situations like this, um, pandemic and particularly in terms of how the government or Putin responds to it or fails to respond to it is to react more so in the forms of what we in the United States might call jokes, but I think are better understood as anecdotes about the absence of appropriate care and response rather than using uh, falling back on or creating new proverbs per se. Let, let me let me add to that, Kevin. You know, since I mentioned two American presidents, one awfully bad and one awfully good, let, let me mention the, the true hero American president, namely Abraham Lincoln. When, when Abraham Lincoln was faced with that slaughtering civil war situation, and when he had just become president and he left Springfield, Illinois, he said on his departure, on his way to Washington, he said, behind every cloud, the sun shines, mm -hmm. which, which nowadays we use in the variant of uh, every cloud has a silver lining. Now that would be a proverb that could be beautifully employed in relation to what Europe and Asia and the rest of the world, Africa is going through right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln was able to find Proverbs that absolutely hit the nerve of the society. Mm -hmm. He would argue against the Southern Baptists using the Bible to, 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 to justify slavery. And then the same little paragraph, he would say, but lest I forget, judge not lest ye be judged. <laughs> you know? So he right away on the, and then of course, he employed the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That, that 
I think is the world's most perfect proverb. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. And, and I, I have here one question from Damian. Uh, dear Wolfgang, great to hear you. Are you already on the lookout for new COVID related proverbs for your dictionary of modern proverbs? Damian, my friend, of course, I'm looking, but you can help me. I should mention that Damian is my hero because he and I wrote that paper together on time is money. And uh, Damian, I'm glad you're there, Damian. I hope you're well. Yes, of course, we all should be looking for them. And maybe next year, as Kevin said, next year in Tavira, we can do it in a lunch meeting or whatever. Let's mm -hmm. all of us bring whatever pandemic related new proverbs we have found. Then we can make a little pamphlet out of it. Yeah. Uh, if you allow me, I can contribute for your dictionary saying that the less visits a day puts the pandemic away. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so that is already playing. That's playing on the structure of an apple a day keeps the doctor away. You know? Yes, of course, of you course. Will, you, will, you will, of course, find that many, many of the proverbs we're going to get that relate to pandemic will use common proverbial structures, you know. Like where yeah, there's yeah. X, there's Y, and so on. Yeah. Okay, let's 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 do that. Let's make a devil's pact, and we'll bring them all next year to Tavira. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all of you.